I'd like to introduce our two panelists for this town hall. Uh, Todd Paglia is Stand Out Earth's executive director. He's joining us from Bellingham, Washington, traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. And Karen Mahan, who we'll get back on video in just a moment, uh, is Stand Out Earth's international campaigns director. And she's joining us from Vancouver, British Columbia, the traditional territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish peoples. Um, and once we have Karen back, Karen, the floor is yours. All right. Um, can, can you see me? We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, because the host has stopped the video for me. Um, uh, so, um, oh, Howie, our technical person is coming to uh, make it all so that you, you want to see me as well as hear me, I'm sure. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh, we wanted to reflect a little bit on the year that was, um, December 1st, so it's almost over. Um, and the year to come. And, you know, thinking about that, it's been quite a year. I mean, it has been a uh, <coughs> year, uh, both um, in the world at large and, and certainly here at Stand. And, you know, it, it, it really feels like we're living in historically uh, significant times. And maybe every generation thinks that. Maybe every generation thinks, you know, their time is the most critical in history. But given the nature of the climate crisis and what we're living through, it really does seem like that is true. Like that this is the decisive decade. What we do in the next 10 years really will define uh, the future, the future for humanity um, and for all the other species that inhabit this earth. So if we, you know, look at it from that point of view and you take all of that and you, and you combine it with living through the Trump era, um, things can get a little heavy, um, a little, uh, a little stressful. And so at Stand, one of the things that we do to deal with this is we have a mindfulness culture. So what we uh, do is we have deliberately cultivated an organizational culture based in mindfulness. And that is um, a strategic choice because we believe that we cannot do our best work in the world unless we're bringing our highest selves and our full selves and really coming from a place of compassion and from a place of solutions and the vision for the world that we want to create. So a stand that might look like uh, starting a staff session with a meditation, or it might look like um, actual mindfulness training. Um, one of our board members, um, Angel, is a, is a leader in this field. Um, and recently, uh, I've started to develop a, a body of work on how do we take the mindfulness work, that kind of approach, and actually bring it to the climate crisis. So let me take just two minutes at the beginning of this call to kind of ground us and tell you what that is looking like um, for me and for us at Stand. Uh, basically, if you take the, a lot of the teachings around the core values of mindfulness and say, how do we bring them to bear on the stresses and potential fears and something like facing the climate reality, you come up with three paths. One is that we have to ground ourselves in really the joy of living. Why, why we are doing this work why we care so deeply is because the things that we care about and that we love are under threat. But we don't spend time, if we spend time that we care about, and if we don't spend time enjoying those things, it's kind of all for naught. So first principle, you gotta enjoy the gift we have and be grateful for it. Second principle, we also have to feel the pain. We have to let ourselves feel the negative. There is a lot of loss and suffering. Just think about the situation in Puerto Rico right now. Think about the fires that happened this summer. It just goes on and on. Um, and so we have to actually let that move through us. Because if we don't, we can kind of harden our hearts to that, which is not what we want. We want to open our hearts to that. By opening our hearts, we kind of take in that pain and we sort of, I think of it as composting it to make, um, to make the fertile ground to take action. And that's what we do here at Stand. We take action uh, in the world from a place of mindfulness, from a place of seeing the joy and feeling the, and feeling the, uh, the pain of it all. So um, that's kind of, for me, that I wanted to offer as a grounding for us um, going into this call. Um, we did want, we want to tell you a lot about what's been happening. So Todd, how about let's go to you and, and, and what is the biggest highlight for you from 2017? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, it was a strange year. Uh, it's not over yet. 
probably get stranger in the next four weeks. Um, but it was also a really good year and a year despite so much uh, negative stuff happening, especially that inspired by, by Trump, um, so much positive uh, stuff happening as well. And when I look back at the year, um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things, oddly enough, that we have to say thank you to Donald Trump for. And one of them is by inspiring millions of people for the first time in their lives, in many cases, to become activists, to become active in their local communities, to work in their counties, states, uh, and on national issues. And that is one of the most hopeful things um, that I've seen in the last year. And, you know, we have dozens and dozens of stories of the various volunteers that make our work possible. And top of mind for this, uh, this week for me is uh, Shiloh Britt, uh, who is a volunteer here at stand.earth. And uh, she was actually a barista at Starbucks uh, for a while. And we have, as many of you know, a major campaign to, to persuade Starbucks to stop using 4 billion uh, single use cups. In fact, this is a cup, this is a paper cup we use um, occasionally uh, that is fully recyclable. Um, the solution already exists. Starbucks will eventually come, come along because of people like Shiloh Britt. Um, but she came to us um, after being a barista and really wanting to try to make change happen. Uh, we have partly through uh, um, Jim Ace, who's the director of our actions and demonstrations uh, here at Stand. Uh, she has been mentored up into um, not just a volunteer, but increasingly a leader um, working on our shipping campaign, uh, working on the Starbucks campaign. And, you know, this week we've had just an incredible week uh, with Starbucks, um, a group of volunteers, including Shiloh um, <clears throat> and Jim Ace and other people at stand uh, have been essentially holding a vigil outside of Starbucks all week long. And it has been a rough week uh, with rain and wind and cold. And uh, the most amazing part of what those folks are doing, and they have the cup monster, uh, uh, the cup wall with 8,000 cups, um, which is one minute of Starbucks cups uh, out in front of the headquarters of Starbucks, um, engaging the Starbucks as they come to work and still there when they go home in the evenings um, all week long. And we both, Karen and I, were on site at different times this week. And the, you know, the most amazing thing, and Karen was on site uh, during some of the time when Shiloh was there, most amazing thing is that, you know, it's not, you know, drudgery and, and shivering and cold. Sure, that happens sometimes, but it's really um, joy and fun. And they're having a great time and engaging with Starbucks, not from a standpoint of anger, but from the standpoint of, hey, you can do this. Um, and when I see that sort of thing happening in our own work and in our allies, um, that's for me one of the big stories of 2017 is, is people taking on this work themselves in their homes and, and cities and towns and doing the stuff um, like Shiloh's doing, who has now been trained up not only to be a leader here, um, but she's now being hired by other organizations to bottom line their demonstrations, actions, protests uh, to help change the world. And there's, there's not much more hopeful than that. Seattle with Shiloh. Oh. Yeah, I'm you're back. Shiloh and uh... She was saying she was sleeping in a truck outside the Starbucks headquarters, and she said, this, "I just love this. This is my happy place <laughs> because doing something, taking action, just does feel so good." I, 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 uh, she's a she's she's phenomenal. Um, you know, I when I look back and I think of uh, I see 2018, I would say I have two highlights. Um, one is uh, this summer I went to um, a meeting in the Norwegian Arctic. Um, and it was a, a really pivotal moment, I think, for the climate movement and that there were activists from all over the world, from Nigeria, where they are still digging oil, digging oil the ground and spilling it in the streets, um, from Argentina, from Russia, from Iraq. Uh, and this was a meeting of people from fossil fuel supply com countries, um, who, countries who are building their, still building their economies off of fossil fuels. Um, and what what became clear in the data that we were looking at there showed us that if right now um, we, everything that's under production right now, all the oil wells and things that are around the world, if they're allowed to continue operating just as they are, we will go well above two degrees. So not only can we not be 
drilling for new oil, not only can we be uh, not developing new, ex new oil and gas, which of course we are all over the world, um, we need to actually curtail what's already in production just to keep us under two degrees. So when you look at it from that lens, you say, okay, we need to have these frontline fights. We need to be keeping it in the ground everywhere. And that's a, something that the grassroots activists that we work with and our teams know and know it intuitively, keep it in the ground. But it's not been what people talk about in policy circles. In fact, the whole Paris Treaty has, doesn't say the word fossil fuel anywhere in the whole document. Um, so uh, we were at the UN conference in Bonn uh, this month. Uh, trying to get this issue onto the agenda so that we can actually move the keep it in the ground movement to a policy level and get nation states and the UN understanding that we have to keep it in the ground because all the renewables in the world aren't going to save us if we can't keep it in the ground. So for us in, for us in Canada, one of the major fights, and I think it actually will become a, a flashpoint globally, not just in North America, uh, is the fight to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Uh, you might have seen some of this um, recently. Uh, just yesterday, uh, we had one of our allies from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Will George, um, go to an event where the CEO of Kinder Morgan was speaking um, and uh, stand up and uh, confront him, interrupt him, uh, to let him know that they had not followed protocol. In fact, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation is in court um, against uh, Kinder Morgan and the federal government for their approval of this pipeline. They, were, they have never given their consent. Um, so uh, the, they are incredibly active and a huge inspiration. Uh, just two weeks ago, we had uh, Haley Zacks, one of our organizers, um, similarly confront the Prime Minister of Canada um, for his decision to override the First Nations local opposition and try and get this pipeline built. And just last month, I myself was arrested at a Kinder Morgan protest um, where, because they are, they haven't started building the pipeline yet, but they are building a marine terminal where the tankers will come in and fill up. And so we want to be stopping them at every step of the way. And that's what you're going to see here um, in, in the early parts of 2018, you're going to see a dramatic escalation in, in this fight to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And, you know, we stopped the Enbridge pipeline, uh, we stopped the Energy East pipeline, the KXL pipeline we don't know about, and now we're going to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So stay tuned um, and get your, your, your ready to come on up and, uh, and help out with, with, uh, with those protests as they emerge in 2018. Yeah, and, and not only just those pipelines, but activists all across North America have stopped over 20 oil train terminals. That's the other way that uh, the oil companies are trying to move their oil to market. And so we're, you know, we have been, as a movement, really successful stopping pipelines and oil train terminals. Um, and you know that's leading to some very serious backlash, uh, this kind of which I haven't really seen, um, you know, in, in years. And I've been doing this work um, for over 20 years. And what that has looked like uh, for us is uh, a lawsuit. Many of you know, um, brought by Resolute Forest Products um, and uh, the Kasowitz Law Firm. That's Donald Trump's uh, law firm that he's used for many years. And this is not just a lawsuit, it's a campaign. Uh, and it is not quite over. We won uh, and you know, un kind of unprecedented early dismissal of the lawsuit um, about a month ago uh, in, the Southern, or in the Northern District of California. So in San Francisco, Federal District Court. And uh, I think we're gonna see a lot more of this sort of thing. Um, there's already one copycat lawsuit, same law firm, Kasowitz, um, being, uh, bringing a lawsuit against Energy Transfer Partners, the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, builder, uh, uh, you know, for ETP against Greenpeace, Bank Track, um, and Earth First, which isn't actually even a legal organization. But what's more scary about this, um, and what we're going to have to contend with in 2018, is that they name a, a couple dozen groups, Rainforest Action Network, Bold, uh, and many others, 350, as a warning, right? So what they're saying with these lawsuits, what, what Resolute is trying to say to us and to Greenpeace and their lawsuit and what um, Energy Transfer Partners is trying to say to dozens of groups is if you are an activist, you'll pay a price. Uh, you will be sued, you'll be dragged in uh, to this lawsuit in some way uh, that will cost you time, money, and effort. And so 
as we see success, as we see pipelines dying, as we see um, oil train terminals being stopped, as we see forest areas being protected, like we've seen in the Great Bear Rainforest, um, we're seeing the companies in desperation begin to strike back at us with new strategies. And, and this particular lawsuit strategy is to try to use racketeering laws, laws used to, to take down the mafia to try to come after civil society. And so that's, you know, very scary. On the upside, um, you know, we, like I said, we won. The, the court in California, though, gave Resolute a chance to amend its complaint. Uh, you would think uh, getting trounced the first time, Resolute might uh, just stop its losses, and it's lost a lot on this lawsuit, millions of dollars, huge reputational risks, lots of customers have left Resolute. You would think that they would be smart enough to stop this nonsense because it's getting them nowhere, uh, but, but they weren't. They're, so they have now refiled their lawsuit, um, and we're going to beat them again. So that's, you know, that's, that's going to be our story. Greenpeace is going to beat Energy Transfer Partners, but I think we have more of this coming. And so what we're doing to prepare um, for us at Stand, uh, we have very good insurance for lawsuits like this. Uh, it has saved, literally saved our lives um, in, in this situation, the life of Stand, I think. Um, we are encouraging other groups to get insured, prepare for the fight. You know the fight's coming, let's get ready for it. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, policies and procedures, some of which we did right, some of which um, we really learned uh, by being sued for $300 million, uh, how you really ought to be, uh, you know, uh, treating your, um, even to the point of how you open and close your door, how you educate uh, employees and former employees about private eyes that might be coming to speak with them, how you deal with document retention. Um, and we're going to be doing some training that um, based on what we've learned in 2018, to all of our NGO partners to say, like, here's what you need to do to get prepared for the oncoming threats. And the threats are really a sign of, of good things. They would not be coming after us. They would not be suing us. They would not be attacking civil society. They would not be promoting legislation, which is happening in dozens of states, to essentially try to make activism illegal if they weren't losing. And they're losing. So it's going to get worse before it gets better, but this is a very good sign um, that, you know, they're overreaching, they're feeling desperate, uh, and we just need to prepare for this next phase of the fight. Examples of that, oh, I'm on, oh good, I'm unmuted. Um, one of the most telling examples of the kind of corporate uh, pushback is uh, uh, Todd and I came to work, Todd was in the Vancouver office um, about, a month, about a month ago, uh, and, um, all of us, we were in a meeting and all of a sudden uh, people in the front office were like, can you come out here? Uh, because there was a sheriff here um, who said he was here on behalf of Enbridge, the pipeline company, to seize all of our assets. Um, <clears throat> and that he was getting a moving truck. Um, there was a moving truck coming to the building in half an hour and they would be literally taking our desks and our computers and our filing cabinets and what little we actually have in the office. Um, this was because uh, and we had uh, taken Enbridge to court uh, several years ago, um, Enbridge and the National Energy Board. The principal suit was against the National Energy Board of Canada, and the issue, and Enbridge intervened, and the issue was that they were not allowing public participation in pipeline hearings. So you, um, you, if you want to participate, you could write a letter, but you could not actually, only the corporate and private interests could come and testify. No one else could at these massive hearings. Um, and you were disallowed to speak about climate change. Literally, in the regulations, no one was allowed to talk about climate change in the pipeline hearings. So we took them to court on this point, and we lost. Now, uh, subsequently, um, that other court cases have ruled that that was unlawful, and the that we have won, ultimately, the, uh, the now we change the rules of the NEB, and the NEB does allow public participation and does allow climate change discussion. But because we lost that original case, Enbridge came after us and said, we owed them for their court costs fighting against the public interest. And we said, oh, we are so not paying for your private corporation's court costs to shut out the public. Um, so they got a judgment against us. And this led to the sheriff coming to our office to seize all the assets, um, which is a little crazy because very soon after the, the, uh, the office was full of journalists, one of him said to me, 
is there even, is there really, this stuff's worth a couple of thousand dollars at most. Your desks are used Ikea furniture and, you're, <laughs> and it's true. Everything is secondhand and reused on our office. Um, but it was a real wake up call to what we are facing and what lengths the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry will go now that they really feel threatened and see that the writing is on the wall for the end of this industry. And as Todd said, this fight is going to get uh, nastier before, uh, before we win. And just a little context on that strange day in the office. Uh, <laughs> I was glad I was up there for it. Um, our team was brilliant uh, and rallied from this position of being, you know, strangely sort of invaded. It had a very invasive feel um, as they took pictures of all of our used, used furniture to make sure we didn't take it out the door when they went to go get the moving truck, which is very strange. Um, you know, there was a the really weird feeling of this is, this is how far they'll go. And this is a company trying to get $14,000. And last year, their revenue was $30 billion. So it's not about the money. Um, and we will see more of that coming up. And I think it's really, when we look at 2017, we're, you know, we're so pleased with so much great work happening from our allies and you know, our own team here and our volunteers. And um, we also are seeing you know, really troubling things happening in the world and, and certainly in the United States. Um, we are seeing how Trump um, has created sort of a reflection of his own hate and division and anger and ignorance. And he didn't create that in the United States, but he is helping breathe that into life. He's, he's, he's encouraging bigotry and racism and misogyny um, and, and you know, a, a disdain for facts and for science. And you see a lot of hate. You see a lot of, a lot of hate happening um, and people being injured in hate crimes and all of that um, and I think it's really important for us uh, really to kind of key off part of how Karen started us off today is to be very mindful about where we're at. Um, we are really fighting from a place of love, um, love for our, this planet, love for our neighbors, love for our cities and towns, and really keeping that foremost in our minds as we go into 2018. 2018 is going to be a year of incredible victories, I believe. Um, and in immense challenges, um, both uh, politically, legally. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of crazy stuff thrown at us as we're getting into more and more deep death throes of the fossil fuel industry. And I think it is so important that we bring to our work and to the people around us to bring light uh, and to really keep centered around the idea that we're fighting for the things we love even if we're fighting against so much hate at times. And that that is the sort of fuel that will bring us through the next year, not only winning, but winning in a way that's sustainable and sustainable for our spiritual selves, for, the, for our souls and for what we wanna bring into the world. And um, I'm looking forward to 2018. Yes, I, I mean, it's going to be, uh, it, is, it will be super challenging and super exciting. Um, let me just give you, uh, before we open it up to questions and conversation, we're so excited to talk with you um, who are on this call, um, some highlights of 2018. Uh, we're going to be moving forward um, in a significant way, both on our, in our climate work and in our forest work. Um, our climate work, you're going to see some uh, new work from us. Um, we're about to launch a campaign um, uh, to try and get the fashion industry to take responsibility for their climate emissions. So fashion um, is responsible for about 5% of the of global emissions. Um, and there really isn't anyone, uh, very few people working on it globally. Um, and you know, a, here's a scary, your scary stat is that uh, since the year 2000, the amount of clothing that each person buys in North America has doubled in the, since the year 2000. So, you know, we just, it's kind of our therapy to deal with the climate crisis as you buy a nice new shirt. Um, I think I might've done it once or twice myself. Um, and uh, the point is that the, we, we need to get these industries to take into account their climate, their climate uh, emissions at the point of production, which is where most of the emissions are. Um, for instance, they're, using, they're burning coal 
um, to make t-shirts or jeans or what have you. Um, these companies can demand renewable energy and that will drive the renew renewable energy, particularly in developing countries. So we're gonna be working on fashion. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be working on shipping. Uh, we this year had uh, a great campaign targeting Carnival Cruise Line um, because, because shipping, you, we're, we think about the emissions from aviation, but we don't really think about the emissions from shipping. But in fact, most consumer goods travel the world by ship. And if there, was, there were simple solutions available, just like, um, for instance, slowing down shipping would decrease the emissions by something like 30, 35%. Um, so we are gonna be engaging with the shipping industry, the cruise ship and other industries uh, to get them to bring down their emissions. So that's 5% for fashion. Shipping's anywhere between about three to 4% right now and might go as high as 20% um, by mid-century. Um, so sectors. And of course, our frontline work will continue um, in Canada, in California, um, in Washington State, uh, up and down the West Coast, and across North America as we uh, work with partner organizations to really try and strengthen the frontline fights that are happening um, all over Turtle Island, a lot of them led by Indigenous people, and we're very happy to be able to um, partner and support um, a lot of those Indigenous-led fights. Um, and on forests, uh, you know, we're, we were forest ethics, we're founded on forests. We, our goal for 2018 is a million acres of old growth protected. Um, I think that's achievable. Uh, we're hiring a new, some new staff. We're going to focus, um, really build more of our, uh, more of our focus on this in 2018. Um, and, you know, part of that, of course, is related to the Starbucks campaign. Um, that's another part of our forest program. Uh, and I think that we might get a victory from Starbucks this year, which will really, in the coming year, which will really transform the industry. Once, if Starbucks, Starbucks makes 4 billion cups a year, uh, you know, something like 3.9, I'm making, I don't know, some huge percentage of those cups go directly to the landfill um, or, or incinerators, um, uh, which has a whole environmental justice component as well. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll see a victory from Starbucks in 2018, uh, you know, just two days ago, Shiloh and I were outside Starbucks giving out uh, coffee to their employees as they were coming into the head office um, in one of the recyclable cups, like the, the kind that Todd, uh, that Todd has here. Um, and, you know, they're, they want to be part of the solution. So we are going to push corporations to go above and beyond what's easy for them and do what's hard for them, because that's what these times call for. And I would, I would like to add one thing onto that, Karen, um, is that you know, we're, we're kind of a scrappy, mid-sized nonprofit, um, and we're always scrambling to raise more money to really bring the heat to these companies and get them to change, do things like Karen is saying that are very uncomfortable. And so one of the things that's hard for nonprofits is actually not just training, mentoring, supporting um, front, frontline groups um, and First Nations and, and leaders and communities that are, you know, hard hit by climate crisis, um, it's but to actually to raise money for them and to to raise money from our online folks from our our high donors and others and to use that money to bring more resources to the front lines and in 2017 this is our, our biggest year ever we raised over 150,000 for support of frontline groups and first nations uh, we're going to do more of that in 2018 so that we can really um, bring to the front lines the people who are, that are hurt worst and first by climate change and by forest destruction, give them the ability uh, to fight back um, and follow their lead as we try to do as, as, as often as possible and give them the ability to, to lead us in the directions we need to go. And to do that in 2018, like I said, from a place of love and for fighting for for the protecting the things that we love, the people and places we love. And that's what we're going to do in 2018. And we hope you'll do it with us. All right. Should we open up the floor for some questions? That would be lovely. All Great. right. Just a reminder that there are four ways that you can ask questions. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can use that. If you prefer your question to be anonymous, you can also ask a private question through the chat option, also at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can pose a question on Twitter using the hashtag StandTownHall. You can also email a question to townhall at stand.earth. Uh, and I will be reading out the question. So 
let's start with one, uh, one first one here. So um, this is from Molly. What's been the biggest surprise in each of your views uh, for 2017? I'll start and say that for me, I think the biggest surprise, and I'm, I'm going to go with the pleasant surprise, um, was that um, in British Columbia, where I'm sitting now, uh, we, against all odds, um, a, a climate-friendly uh, NDP government was elected. Um, six months before that, everyone was saying it's not possible, they can never be elected. And the thing is, we don't know no, about no, it. We don't know. I mean, anything can happen. And they were elected on the promise to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline um, and to be climate leaders. So to me, that was, it's a very hopeful um, and a sign that, um, yes, there's, there's all the craziness, uh, and, but, and, but, but we are a growing majority who realize the significance of this time and this issue. And this was one high point for me. And they've been doing a good job so far. They haven't stopped the pipeline, but we'll make sure they do. Yeah, I, I, for me, it, this is easy. Um, it's people showing up. You know, there's so much talk about uh, people not voting, you know, not caring, not doing, you know, the things that they need to be doing to, to fight for their climate change and for forest protection. And um, I mean, I really think tr Trump has woken people up in a way I've never seen. And, you know, we've had a, a bunch of things that we did this last year where we were really stretched on our organizing capacity and um, actually put a little less into, um, for example, organizing the, the International Day of Action against oil trains uh, this past summer. And um, we had, in some cases, like add a zero to the number of people who showed up for those protests. Uh, and a lot of that was like self-organized, driven by the grassroots, driven by frontline people. And we're seeing that all across the spectrum for all the issues we work on and all the things that we care about, people are really getting up and taking this personally and getting out in the streets and calling their legislators. And when we say climate is local, and that's one, been one big piece of our work in the last couple of years and going forward, it's because of all those people forcing mayors, city councils, county councils to do the right thing. Um, and saying that their jobs are on the line. So that has been just an incredible uh, surprise to me. I didn't think people would, would go that big. And um, it's, it's amazing. And it's a, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's going to become more and more powerful as we go into 2018 and, and get better at grappling with the idea that so many people want to volunteer and help because we weren't really set up for that. And we're getting more and more set up for it. So are our allies. Thanks. We have a question from Ditmar. Uh, how did the moving truck incident resolve with the, at the office? <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so, I, I, I want, I want you, 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 you know, we were, we were both there, Karen, but what my favorite memory of that, that whole insane day um, was so, as Karen was saying, we, we ended up getting media there as they went to go get their moving truck. Um, and then they weren't showing back up. And, and we now had five or six media outlets, cameras going, Karen's being interviewed live on you know, TV and radio and blogs are being written and, and articles are being written on the site in our office. Um, and so I, I thought, all right, now bring it. Like now that you, there's gonna be witnesses, I want, we want you to come back. And so I said to Karen, like call the sheriff guy. Like, Cause she, she had his number. I said, get him back. Get them back here and, and tell them, come and take our stuff. Now that, you have, now that people will see you take it on behalf of Enbridge, come back and take it. And what did, what did they tell you, Karen? Uh, they said that they, uh, they were waiting for their instruction and would let me know if they were coming back, but they were not coming back at this time. <laughs> and then a little while later, Enbridge tweeted out, we will not be pursuing this further. So as soon as there was some sunlight, uh, you know, they disappeared. Thanks, Ditmar. Didn't mean to leave you hanging there. Um, we have a question from Diane. Um, what is the position of Standout Earth on global animal agriculture and its impact on climate change? Mm. Karen, you want to take that? No, I want you to take that. <laughs> I'm really glad for the question because the whole agricultural issue is massive and uh, I don't think there's enough being done generally, but 
response. No, this, I mean, this is not something that we work on um, in a significant way at stand, but it's something, uh, it's not possible actually to move forward towards a climate stable world uh, and have the number of cows, sheep, you know, all of the livestock and all of the many, all the cruelty that occurs in that system uh, and the waste and the climate impacts and the you know, impacts on people living near these facilities. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's just awful. And I'm, I've been heartened to see at least some moves happening, uh, you know, meatless Mondays and, you know, with some, some high profile chefs. Um, I think there's the millennials are certainly more oriented uh, away from that, that type of diet. Um, but I think we need a lot more campaign activity uh, and a lot more leadership from uh, elected officials on this because uh, we can't get to where we want to get to with this system. All right. Um, here's a good question from Kenneth. How is Stand different from groups like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club? Karen, take a shot. <laughs> well, I would say that I used to work for Greenpeace um, and I have a lot of friends who work for the Sierra Club. Um, so I would say one difference um, from Greenpeace say is that we're really interested in uh, practical solutions that we can realize right away. And not to say that Greenpeace isn't, um, but in some instances, in many instances, Greenpeace kind of takes the, uh, the moral position and maintains it, which that's a very useful role. Um, but I see our role more as taking that position and then working like you know, at an advocacy level, at the high level, you know, of hanging the banner, but also like in the corp, in with the corporations, in with the corporations, in with the governments, writing legislation, writing policy. We really, our role is to get in there and make the ideal real. Um, that's what I'm. That's how I feel that we're different from them. Yeah, and I would I would add on um, the one the one of the things that we really try to do is we try to not pile on. Um, I think there's a lot of things where there's just a whole bunch of groups working on it. Um, and for the industries we're taking on, we need a lot of people. Um, so that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Where Stand really is looking though is where are the gaps? Uh, where are the areas where there's just not a lot of activism? It's not necessarily the sexy campaign out there, but it's important and needs to be transformed. And so when we look at, there's not a lot of groups working on the climate aspects of the fashion industry. Um, not a lot of groups working on the shipping sector but there are big brands in both areas. Uh, there's a lot of exposure and risk um, to those companies if they just continue to plow forward with business as usual. And uh, a lot of the employees working at those places want those companies to help be a solution to the problem, uh, not exacerbating those problems. And so we see opportunity in a lot of places where most groups are not working. We have a question from Peter. Why have we heard so little about the recent pipeline spill in the U.S.? The KXL spill, I assume, is what he's referring to. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think that the, what I have learned over the last you know, six, seven years that we've worked on um, oil trains and we've worked on pipelines for longer, um, there is, an, there is a weird sort of silence. There was some coverage of it. Um, but if the New York Times did an incredible piece where they mapped all the oil spills over the last decade or 15 years, I forget what the time frame was. Um, we thought pipelines before we started working on them, like how could you have a leaky pipeline? What, like what situation would occur other than an earthquake where that would happen? Um, and what you see is a lot of what you see in other industries. Um, do, doing it as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible, without regard for what the problems are. And um, I think our governments and our media have accepted that, you know, this is a cost of doing business. They just leak, whatever, you know, get over it. And that's part of what uh, the movement, actually, if you look at even five years ago, there's a lot more coverage of spills, of oil train, um, you know, near disasters or spills and pipeline spills. Um, it's not enough, but there's so much more coverage than there was 10 years ago, uh, and we need to keep going in that direction. And I just will add that in Canada, actually, there was quite a bit of coverage, even though it happened, this will happen in the United States. And maybe that's because the pipeline debate um, here is heating up. Um, but, you know, and on that spill, you may know, but that's three, that's the third spill for KXL, which is a seven-year-old pipeline. Um, you know, the pipeline, you know, there are a lot of pipelines that are 40, 50, 60 years old. 
Um, so it was, uh, it, it, it is a real indicator of the lack of, the lack of safety and quality controls in this industry. That segues nicely to our question from Sarah. Uh, if the Kinder Morgan pipeline does get final approval and starts construction, what will be your next focus in Canada? Will you continue to fight this or move on to a new issue? Good question. Um, the answer is first we will win this. It, ha it does, <laughs> and then we'll move on. Um, it has been approved, the Kinder Morgan pipeline has been approved uh, by the federal government of Canada um, in the final, uh, final approval. Um, but um, just because the pipeline has been approved certainly doesn't mean it will be built. Um, the, uh, the Northern Gateway pipeline that went to the northern coast of Canada um, was approved and we worked with our allies, First Nations allies and others, um, and were able to defeat that pipeline. Um, and so it has been approved. I do think that we will beat it back. It is going to take everything we have and everything everyone else can bring to the table. Um, once we don't have to fight that fight anymore, um, uh, we, I would, am very excited for us to, uh, take on more of the, uh, the LNG industry. Um, that's a, uh, they're still trying to grow the LNG industry, uh, despite, um, a lot of difficulties. So that, that, um, will be one of the next places that we go. All right. I have a question. I have a question, uh, from Tracy, if I could give you one million extra dollars, I can't. By the way, how would you spend it? Uh, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, I would, I would have a lot of that funding go to um, key allies on the ground who are the front line for pipeline, oil train, um, uh, as well as who are the front lines uh, receiving a lot of the the toxic impacts of the shipping industry, which often keeps their ships running 24 seven and guess where those plumes of smoke go, usually low income um, neighborhoods with people of color. So what we have seen um, and we, we did in the oil train um, work, especially we have done a bunch of work on pass through grants uh, where you have people who are just straight up volunteering um, and they need yard signs. They need door hangers for, getting a community meeting to happen. They need shirts because they're all going to wear, wear the same shirt to the hearing to provide a visual uh, sort of exclamation point to the fact that 90 plus percent of the people there oppose this given project. Um, that's where I would, I would put the funding because I think that those people um, who are just fueled by a passion to protect their own homes and their own communities um, are just doing amazing work. And uh, that's, that's, you know, that, that piece of our movement needs more and more support. I would say exactly the same thing. I would say indigenous and frontline uh, communities and everything that we can do to support, amplify and, and connect them. This is a question from Pat. How do you make sense of Rachel Notley's strong stand for pipelines? For many of this, this is many of us, this has been a surprise and we wonder how to counter it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and, and Karen, give a little background for uh, our US folks. So Rachel Notley is the premier of, of Alberta, um, basically Kansas, Texas. It's our oil jurisdiction, uh, oil producing jurisdiction. Um, and uh, Rachel Notley is, a, I think, a, uh, quite strong on climate change. Um, I was pleased to be one of her uh, advisors on her oil sands advisory group for how to deal with squaring the, 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 the circle of uh, being a oil producing jurisdiction that understands the climate crisis. So she did introduce um, a number of really great policies, including a price on carbon. Um, it, she was, it, this was the first jurisdiction in the world, the first oil producing jurisdiction in the world to self-impose a price on carbon. Um, we were happy to ha be helping with that. Um, but she has all along said that she wants a pipeline. Uh, my own view is that that is a political view and that she thinks that she cannot be reelected unless she is uh, out there seem to be getting a pipeline. She as much said this much last week when she was in Ottawa, she's touring the country right now, selling pipelines to Canadians. Um, and she literally said, if I don't get this pipeline, you'll be dealing with the conservative party um, who will then be much worse for the climate. 
So I think it's a political issue to do with the, the, the demographics in Alberta um, that are generally uh, more pro-pipeline. Um, I, uh, and she's in a conundrum. It's a really hard situation for, for uh, economies that have, have been dependent on oil. It's not their future, but a lot of the politicians are, are in this trap of that's, you know, there's an there's a organized right wing that believes that and is going to push for that agenda. And she's, she's caught in that. Uh, from Becca, do you have any plans for the UK? I'm based in London and I'm really keen to make things happen over here. Uh, we don't at this point, but we work with volunteers all over the world and there's a lot of Starbucks in the UK and a lot of other issues to work on. So, um, and there's been actually quite a bit of attention uh, on Starbucks and other coffee companies that use, you know, throwaway cups. I mean, you have this incredible system of forests to cup for a moment and then landfill and uh, we need to we need to break that cycle and uh, if you want to work on starbucks you let us know becca we'll get back to you <laughs> we have a question from nicholas what are the next steps for the kinder morgan fight any recent updates yes um thanks for the question the uh so the biggest development that will happen in kinder morgan is the lawsuit so the, there are 19 plaintiffs, I believe, that have a, um, a, they've combined all the different lawsuits because there were so many um, from different nations, uh, municipalities, um, uh, environmental groups. They put them into one case, um, and that case was heard a few weeks ago here in Vancouver. And the courts don't tell you exactly when they'll make a decision, but the best guess would be something like June. Um, so one possibility is that the, we that the we win the case and the pipeline uh, is um, not allowed to proceed. Unfortunately, uh, while the case is before the courts, there's nothing that stops the company from starting building. So right now they're building, as I said, their marine terminal, and you might have seen these images. They built this huge fence around it with barbed wire all around the top um, to stop protesters from uh, getting close to it. Um, and uh, they're going to start breaking ground. Their schedule is to start breaking ground in January. So right now uh, you have this Aquamic Nation um, building tiny houses in the way of the pipeline. Um, you are going to see, uh, and, and I, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see on the ground um, encampments and struggles um, all along the pipeline route. Um, I encourage you to participate in any of those you can to make a donation if you can't get there. The other piece of that is that TD Bank in Canada, one of the five big banks, is financing the, the pipeline. Basically, Kinder Morgan could not, couldn't afford to do this. It's a $7.2 billion project. So they have a line of credit with the TD Bank. Um, so there will be TD Bank protests um, all across the country and some in the US. Um, so stay if, you know, wherever you live, um, stay tuned for how you can um, get involved. We're doing that along with 350.org and Greenpeace. So that's another local way to, to plug in. At this point, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, if you've thought about asking a question and haven't done it yet, now's your time. Um, so, oh, here's a good one. Okay, so this is from Annette. How has Stan's work evolved, if at all, since your name change? So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, actually, our work evolved and that led to the name change. So we were, you know, we were forest ethics for a long time, 15 years. And we were increasingly sort of compelled, dragged in in the, the, the several cases um, by what was happening on climate starting a decade ago. Um, and that became more and more of our work uh, and more and more of what our volunteers wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, over time it became really awkward because we were like organizing in inner cities around uh, oil trains and we were forest ethics. Uh, so um, that took some explaining and, uh, and, we, and we did that. But uh, Stand feels like so much more of who we are and who we are, you know, we're increasingly becoming that it just feels right. And actually our, our work continues to evolve as it had been and we don't feel as hemmed in 
by a name that was not only felt a little bit sort of last century, um, but that defined our work, you know, forests in particular in a way that made no sense anymore. Um, and we're definitely still a very forest oriented group. I'm still very passionate about forest protection. And those of you who have looked at our logo, you know, there's a tree hidden in there somewhere. So um, that work continues, but um, we will, will really continue to expand uh, the work on climate change and forests are a climate issue and uh, stand just feeling like home, uh, the name to us. Mm -hmm. All right, one last question. Um, and this is from George. For those of us who would like to get more involved, what would you recommend and where do you need the most support right now? Hmm. Mute. Um, uh, I've said, I'm always going to say Kinder Morgan because we were talking in our Vancouver office the other day. Um, and um, I said to our digital director, Liz, I said, well, I mean, I, Kinder Morgan, you really, I mean, Kinder Morgan's a big issue for you. And she said, well, I mean, I care about all the issues. What do you mean? And I said, well, I, th I thought you really, Kinder Morgan's really important. And she said, well, I mean, they're going to build that pipeline over my dead body. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Enough is enough. Um, so, uh, Kinder, if, you know, if you're in BC or in Canada, Kinder Morgan, if, they're in the, if you're in the U.S., uh, line three is a great issue. These oil train terminals are a great issue to get involved in. Uh, if, if KXL, if they actually try and proceed with KXL, which is not sure, well, it's not clear at this time that they will, um, but if they do, um, that's a great issue, um, as well as any issue in your local community um, around uh, fossil fuel infrastructure or the financing of fossil fuels. So that's where I would say um, is, the, is, is the place to get involved. Yeah, and I, I echo all of that. Climate is local. There's probably something having to do with oil inf infrastructure or LNG or something in your region. Um, and that's a great place to plug in. And I also have to say, you know, look at what's happening on Capitol Hill today. Um, we have uh, an enormous gift going out to massive companies that need no additional money. Like the, the amount of uh, money on hand by in corporate America and, and global corporations is enormous and the tax bill moving forward will give them even more money. Um, and we're really looking increasingly at companies to be the change uh, that needs to happen when you know Trump won't do anything. We do know that if it's, we're talking about the apparel, the fashion sector, the shipping sector, um, Starbucks, uh, other groups working on big corporate campaigns that will make fundamental change happen. Um, I think this is this next year. It's, they can't say they don't have the money to do it. Uh, you know, and I think increasingly what we have seen over the last 10 years is an incredible evolution of passion at the employee level. They don't want just a paycheck. They want companies that match their values. And the more we can point out that by going big on climate change, by going big on forest protection, you not only uh, do the right thing, but you will retain your highest uh, value employees for a longer period of time. It makes financial sense. It makes environmental sense. Uh, and I think that's where we really need to go bigger in, in, in 2018. Yes, oil infrastructure, and we need to hold companies to account. On that note, uh, if we didn't get to your question, uh, thank you for asking it. We'll follow up with you after this. Um, thank you to everyone who asked questions. Great, insightful. We know we have a, such a smart community um, and you're passionate about the issues as we are. And we are lucky to be able to work on your behalf out in the world. And with that, I think we'll draw to a close. If you think of anything, want to ask more, uh, please drop us an email at townhall at stand.earth um, or on Twitter at stand uh, with the hashtag stand town hall. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Karen. Thank all of you for attending. Thank you. And thanks everyone for being out there and uh, for all the work you do, whether it has anything to do with stand or not to, to make our world a better place. We really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to a great 2018. Mm -hmm. a great 2018 for all. <laughs> thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks.